Okay. Good evening. Hi, can you all hear me okay? Wonderful. Welcome to REMCAD. It is my honor and pleasure to uh, welcome you guys to the Shirley Say Vital, Vital Organs Exhibition. I have been following Shirley's work for a few years and just am amazed that she agreed to come out and do the exhibition, so thank you. I'd also like to thank all the work-study students that helped with the installation and support. And finally, I'm honored to introduce Anna Mascarella, the coordinator of the Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program, who's going to introduce the program to you, as well as give you a little bit of background on Shirley. So, Anna? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I am proud to bring you the 10th installment of REMCAD's public lecture series, which is part of our Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program. The VASD program is an interdisciplinary initiative that fosters vision, creativity, and innovation by bringing leading artists, scholars, and designers to campus. Providing direct access to contemporary culture, the program creates a cross-disciplinary environment made possible through appreciation and critical inquiry. As the coordinator for the VASD program, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Shirley Say. Born in Hong Kong, Shirley relocated to Los Angeles in the 1990s. Her sculpture, installation, and photography explore the mutability of materials, in particular plastics, and their relationship to contemporary artistic, political, and environmental concerns. Her work has been exhibited worldwide at the 2002 Sydney Biennial, uh, the 2002 Biennial American Brazil, at the Kaohsiung Museum of Fine Arts in Taiwan, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the PS1 Contemporary Art Center at MoMA, to name just a few. As you can tell, that list is very wide, and it goes on and on. Say received a City of Los Angeles Individual Artist Fellowship in 2008, and in 2009, she received the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. In addition to participating in many artist and residency programs, Say has served as a guest faculty at the Yale School of Art, California College of the Arts, and Northwestern University in Chicago, among others. Shirley has been the member of the faculty at Cal Art since 2001, where she currently co-directs the Department of Art. Tonight, Shirley will discuss the philosophy of her practice and the way in which she constructs frameworks for the objects and materials that dominate the visual landscape of our world. So thank you all very much for coming tonight, and please join me in welcoming Shirley Fay. Good evening, thanks for coming. I want to thank Remcat for bringing me here, and I want to take this opportunity to also thank Courtney and Anna for making everything happen. And uh, it's, uh, without them, this won't happen. And so far has been a really wonderful experience putting the show together, and I'm really pleased to see some of my most current work that have never been shown before that is sitting here in three galleries. So it's been a re really exciting night for me. And tonight, um, the title of my t lecture is called From Plasticity to Negotiation. When I thought about this title, I was thinking about the sort of recent development in my uh, most current work, and it, it takes certain turns from the older body of work. And that's how I came up with the title. But the more I think about it, especially reviewing some of the older work that I've done, both the concept of plasticity and negotiation actually were in there in the very beginning. So that was actually a very pleasant surprise for me to rediscover the, the link between them from the very beginning in a different way. And tonight I brought over, uh, I don't know, I think over like 100 images. So that's quite a number of work to go through. And uh, I would not spend, uh, extend 
save time on each of them, as you can see that there's a time limit to that. But I might dwell on a particular image just to um, tell you some story behind the concept of the piece. So do bear with me and it will move on. But then there are times when I will skip quite a few images because we need to get to the next idea. So that's kind of how I'm going to organize uh, the showing of the images and how I'm going to talk about them. And I oftentimes like to start with my lecture with this piece that is untitled, and it was done back in 95, I, I believe. That's right. So it's untitled. What you see here is a sculpture that stands about just shy, like about four feet tall, and it's made of found styrofoam block. That is the, the packaging styrofoam that you see every day. You know, when you buy a computer, it comes in a cardboard box, and inside there's that pristine, brand new trash, as I would call it. And uh, what I've done to it is that I took three different kinds of vinyl, and I um, painstakingly traced the facet of each block and cut them out and then glue them back together to cover the blocks. And I can show you, here's another view of the sculpture. And here's a detail you can see better of how this is done. In a way, I'm kind of making a upholstery for this styrofoam block. And um, it's quite labor intensive. As you can see, there are negative space inside the block and I would, you know, took the pains to even measure the inside surface of those hole to cover them. So, and um, here's another view of it. And the reason why I did that, because I really want to bring the viewer's attention to the shape of this block, which is really intricate. And you, you see them all the time, you kind of figure out, okay, this must be the negative space that fit the positive space of the appliances or what have you. But then if you look closer, um, I'm gonna go back just uh, to, to the previous slide. If you look closer, then all of a sudden you notice that there will be, um, for example, that uh, those negative holes that I mentioned before, you kind of wonder what, why, is, why are they there? It doesn't really fit anywhere into the computer or the TV. And then there's like, this little I would call them the protrusion shape in the front of the block that is uh, positive. And then if you turn to the back of the block, that is the negative space for the protrusion. And I really look at them and, you know, they certainly have a kind of sci-fi quality to it. And um, I'm really drawn to, you know, why these shapes are there that is so intricate. And um, it, it looks like it, it, the the decision that come into designing this ultimate form come from many different reasons and not just come from one source. So that's what it, that intrigued me to do some research on it. And I did eventually call up um, uh, Hewitt Packet and was managed to talk to someone. And they explained to me that the negative holes in the block is, usually sits in the corner because we're talking about ma mass uh, production process here. And if you empty out those uh, volume in the corner, if you're talking about a kind of mass production, then you end up saving a lot of material and that is material cost. So the reason why they are there is purely for cost efficiency reason. And those little um, poacher shins on the top of this block, and then there is the um, negative side of it. Those are for the block um, to link themselves for ease of transportation, so they don't fall off, so you can like move them easily. So that was the reason that is there. There is the transportational reason. And, um, and then, of course, there are um, the, the rest of the shape that is there for cushioning the product. And some of you are here today and you know, you think that you're gonna come here a sculptor speaking about art that is more fine art. It's like, why is she standing up here talking about industrial design now? And the reason why is that is I'm really drawn to that because um, at that time I was, uh, I just finished graduate school and 
During school, I was really fascinated by the idea of subjectivity and how, when one makes certain decision in making uh, an artwork, what goes into the process of uh, of that decision making. And I was completely, I was particularly drawn to industrial design because I liked the idea that the formal outcome of this shape does not come from a single source. It comes from multiple sources. Some of them is functional reason, some of them is economic reason, some of them is transportational reason. So it is a ne the final form is a negotiation among multiple sources. And to me, that was a really powerful um, form, and that kind of explained my attraction to them. And, um, and the reason um, why I was so um, intrigued with it, because um, that comes from something that I learned in the, uh, school, and I thought, uh, since some of you are in school right now, I thought I would share with you. And um, I started uh, my undergrad in a department back in Hong Kong at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And they were pretty traditional, and I was doing a lot of paintings and kind of abstract expressionist painting style thing. And I remember I was painting in a classroom one day and the professor said something like, Shirley, if you put a little bit more red there, it will be better. And if you move the shape a little bit to the left, that will be better. And at that time, I thought, um, I don't know a lot about art, you know, I'm still a, you know, an undergrad. And I thought they were talking about painting language. But the inner logic of that language is oftentimes very elusive, if not totally inapplicable. And however, there's always an exception to the logic. And um, sometimes it's desirable, the exception to the logic is desirable, sometimes it's not. And the secret question I dare not to ask at that time was, who decides these rules? Who are they? What are they? Are they really universally true or they are specific to a, a, a time and a culture? So that was an undergrad time. And then fast forward, I ended up at the Art Center College of Design in, uh, in LA. And then, I, since then, I stayed. And um, in grad school there, I was bombarded with questions like, these kind of secret question. I wasn't painting then, I was already making an object and sculpture. They asked me constantly. My professor asked me constantly, why this color? Why is this dimension? Why is this choice of material? Why is this thing four and a half feet long and not four and, and, and um, uh, seven inches long? So as if, if my answer was, quote, because I like it, end quote, is insufficient, ill-informed, or naive. So I really felt harassed by them, totally. But at the same time, I realized that they're really, really important questions. The key to originality and a unique voice is not just being a genius or having the ability to express, but to not make assumption. I finally realized that. I started to question my sensibility or my subjectivity. Are those unconscious stuff or they are subconscious decision that yet to be uncovered? Or they are the desire that is uniquely my own or they are conditioned by my culture or my history or the surrounding around me? So these are questions that indeed um, become the basis of my practice even up to today. I still think about these questions. One day, uh, it dawned on me that subjectivity can never be singular. It is always multiple to me. 
Maybe it's a little bit of my own. Maybe it's a little bit of where I come from. Maybe it's socially constructed. Maybe it's a little bit of me messing with that construction. It's all of the above. The idea of convergence, convergence of different voices, is、um, however cacophonous they are, were very, very powerful for me. It is not isolated, or stable, or well defined. Indeed, it's always a paradox, always in flux. So these are some of the notes that、uh, I wrote down.、Uh, what I, what I paid that hefty tuition for. That I,、uh, having trouble to、uh, continue to pay at some time. And、uh, so, but it's worth it. I learned a lot. And moving on. I'm not going to say too. It's belonged to the same series around the same time. This piece have a really convoluted title. It's called、um, "If My Childhood Dream Was to Visit Disneyland, I Would Have Had a Healthier Psyche." So think about it. You can ask me afterwards. But so, oh, maybe I'm skipping a little bit too fast. So on that piece of vinyl, it's a vinyl that、uh, I molded.、Um, Using a heat gun, and then I pour、um, liquid plastic in it. So this is a detail to show that there's sort of a puddle, and the majority of them are kind of more or less formed organically. And then one of them, you can see here to the lower left-hand side, is、uh, is a cutout. So I cut out、uh, material from the vinyl, and then I added extra material to build the wall around it to form that. "Quote unquote puddle." So, in a way, this is sort of the the plastic surgery of the piece. And、um, see, I thought I was not going to talk about it. Since I start talking about it, I will keep talking. And、um, so, in a way, you know, Disneyland and plastic surgery. This piece is really is a、uh, is a way for me to contemplate on the idea, more like the kind of Platonic idea of the ideal. Versus the model, and the ideal versus the simulation, and the ideal versus the everyday accidental appearance, nomina or phenomena, if you wish. So that's sort of what this piece is about. And then、um, shortly after that、um, body of work, I was really into the the you know the material.、Um, Uh, synthetic material like plastic, or the kind of particular everyday plastic, because、um, it is because I was interested in multiplicity and paradox, and I saw I saw a lot of paradox in、uh, synthetic material, especially packaging material that is made of plastic, because these are material that are、um, ubiquitous. You see it all the time, everywhere, but then at the same time, they are otherworldly. And they are very light, but at the same time they're very strong. At the same time, and structurally they are.、Um, it is the one of the first material that could be both surface and structure at the same time. And I'm talking about、um, in, injection mold product that can be structure, very strong structure, but then is exactly the, the material itself. So you kind of have、um, can. Um, move away from the more traditional idea of sculpture being having an armature and then a surface, a sort of skeleton versus a, a a surface material. You can have both at the same time. So that's sort of, sort of what motivated me to to do this piece that is quite large. And、um, this is an installation shot that didn't、uh, capture. Uh, the scale of the piece, unfortunately, but、um, just sort of show you that it's made of plastic bags, and I started out with a cube, and then it kind of grow in this sort of a bunch of grape form. And the reason why I show you this piece is、uh, I was mostly interested in this sort of plastic and、um, surface and structure. But、um, to my eye, it, it looks like I inflated it with.、Uh, You know my own breath, so to speak. So the title of this piece is actually "She Got That Air." So I blow air into it, and then I use a, a heat sealer to seal the seam. 
And during the duration of the show, it deflated. And it's, it's meant to be that way because I want it to be breathing and sort of like a, almost like a body. And because it has such an organic quality, I, um, I had this idea to, to um, take it out on a walk, so to speak. So the next thing I know, I, was on, um, I went on a, a camping trip to the Death, uh, the Death Valley, that's right, there was the Death Valley. And we took, now we're uh, moving around 96, I believe, 96, 97. And uh, at that time, I only have been in LA for maybe four or five years, still pretty new to the area. And I wanted to explore the desert. And because I grew up in Hong Kong, I um, was very familiar with plastic bags. So the plastic stuff, you know, also plastic covers, you name it, you know, tablecloth, plastic covers, utensil, everything is made of plastic. So in a way that is a second nature to me, it's very comfortable for me to, to see plastic around me. But when I went to Death Valley, I had a cultural shock. <laughs> I have never seen such an expanse of landscape before because once again, for those of you not familiar with Hong Kong, you can imagine New York, only 10 times even more intense. So that's Hong Kong. And so, as maybe you can imagine how um, a barren landscape like Death Valley will be a total uh, alien to me. And um, so for me, it's sort of the reverse. And so I went on this camping trip, I took the sculpture along, I cut it up, and I uh, let it uh, go on a walk. And so it, it sort of tumbled with the wind like a tumbleweed. And I shot a road of film. For those of the younger one, if you know what that was, there was film, it was not digital. So, and I printed out three of my favorite images and that is a photographic series. And this series is called uh, Vagabond, question mark, or Wanderlust. So when the piece was done, it was, uh, I think this, uh, it's actually a year, uh, the, the, May, the year was, it was made was 98. And that was the beginning of the other uh, part of my body of work, which is the photographic series. I don't claim myself to be a photographer, but I'm really interested in using photography as a medium to investigate phenomenon, especially object in this world. I am really interested in the concept of sight. The concept of sight does not stop as the physical sight because um, you can talk about sight as a, a kind of social construction, as a kind of institutional construction, as well as um, uh, a representational device. So, and I do see photography occupy that space and articulate a site. And uh, moving forward, oh, this is fun. We're getting to the fun part. So since um, I was really interested in, in the um, plastic for a number of reasons, you know, some of the practical reason is some, 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 something that is really light, you know, and as a female, I can use uh, plastic to construct a room full size of insulation all by myself, kind of move it, you know, I don't need anyone to help me. They feel really liberating and also the materials are so malleable, you can mold it any way you want, it's really fun to work with. Although eventually I learned how toxic it is, so for those of you who are working with the material, be careful. And, um, but on the other hand, it really is the um, sort of semi semiotic references of plastic that really sustain my interest in using this material, particularly uh, packaging material. Because when you think of it, packaging plastic is the prime signifier of our time, the time we live in right now. If you think about the 20th century, which is the last century, can you believe that? I can't believe that myself. Um, the 20th century is all about movement. 
be it the movement of goods, as in trading, or the movement of people, as in migration. And me being one of them, I'm an immigrant to the United States. So packaging material is the prime signifier of that movement. It's the residue of that process. It's the brand new trash. It's the reminder of that transit, of that uh, transmutation that uh, had happened. So, and because I was really interested in that, I continued to do more research even beyond writing my thesis in graduate school. I was writing, I was doing a lot of research into uh, the history of plastic. It was very fascinating to, to me because as an immigrant, the history of plastic also tell you a very interesting history of the United States. It goes hands in hand, especially through the early era of plastic being a utopian object to uh, kind of um, dystopian object later on in the 70s with the rise of environmentalism and then to more recent time, this sort of ambiguous, you know, in between uh, a state. So even the connotation went through multiplicity of uh, interpretation. And so, and then I, at that time, I was, you know, working with sculpture in installation, trying to entertain a lot of this research I did. And at one point, I realized that sometimes some of these ideas and research is better represented through text and language rather than in visual form. And that's perfectly okay, even though I'm a visual artist, I'm primarily a visual artist, but I'm also a thinking being. You know, I teach, I read, I talk, I converse. These are all linguistic form. So I, I took upon that writing as part of my artistic practice at the same time. So continue to write and try to publish as much as I can, although that is a whole another story. And, uh, but I was lucky enough to be invited to a conference put together by Chris Krause, and she's a writer herself and also um, a uh, filmmaker. And she put together this conference called a Chance Conference, and she was really interested in the idea of chance and chaos theory. And, uh, and simulation and artificiality all at once. So, but she had this idea because it's called chance, it's about artificiality. She didn't want the conference to uh, happen in a kind of regular academic uh, situation. So she wanted, uh, she had this brilliant idea to host the, the academic conference in a casino. And then she wanted to invite, um, uh, and eventually did uh, invite Baudrillard, Sean Baudrillard to be the keynote speaker. So, you know, six months later, all of a sudden we find ourselves in, <laughs> in State Line, Nevada, in a casino with a full bar in the back of this, like an auditorium like this. And then we have DJ Spooky doing performances and a, uh, a Wall Street broker who traded with chaos theory gave a presentation and she invited me to do a uh, presentation on my research and I wrote a paper that took the form of a slide lecture that um, and also have a performance component to it because I came on stage wearing a full plastic garb and like thick wig and a lot of plasticky things and the title of my uh, lecture is called um, Post-Colonial Mutation and Artificiality, using Hong Kong as a case study. And uh, I don't have time to, obviously, to read you the whole essay, but I want to share with you a snippet of that uh, performance slash presentation. And I'm going to read you a little story that by now, you should, I, I believe all of you, oh, no. So what do we do? <laughs> How did that happen? I thought we did. So by now we have, um, it's become a familiar story with uh, the news. And 
I, I quote you this part of the essay because, um, because I started to talk about the paradox of plastic and artificiality, and this is a perfect sample. So um, this is the part when I was showing this, this slide in that lecture, and uh, here it goes. An incident in 1992 gives us the perfect sample of the multiplicity and paradox of artificiality. A freak ocean storm washed a container off a freighter in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, releasing 29,000 plastic bathtub toys being shipped from Hong Kong to Tacoma, Washington. Over the next year, thousands of blue turtles, red beavers, yellow duck, and green frog washed upon the Alaska coast giving oceanographer a great deal of data on North Pacific winds and current. The marine research community dubbed this incident, quote, quack hurt around the world, end quote, and used it to update their computer model of the ocean. By the way, the slides are only a simulation of the actual situation. This was the, I took this in uh, Santa Monica Beach, so, and no, I did not leave the ducky, rubber ducky in the ocean. I would never dare to do that. I collect them. So here's a perfect uh, true story, new story about, as you, you probably heard, have heard about this story, but uh, when I gave the lecture back in 96, it was um, uh, not very well known then. So when I read this new story, I had many questions especially to the paradox and multiplicity that this implies. So these are the, the multiple questions that I ask of this story. Was this a violation of natural Alaskan beauty by the efforts of our industry? Number one question. Was it a violation? Is it like really bad for the environment that this happened? Number two, is this a boon to scientific knowledge? Oh, maybe it is a good thing because we did use it to update our computer uh, model of the ocean so that eventually they can use that data to improve our life. So is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Or does it mean another rush order creating much needed jobs and overtime for Hong Kong factory workers? Because for the longest time, Hong Kong was the toy manufacturer capital before it was taken over by China. Hong Kong is made plastic by other industrialized power, but then in turn bombards the West with an uncontrollable wave of plastic, washing ashore to rich inner city slum and minority neighborhoods, ending up as worthless pile of factory excess. For ours is a plastic generation with no nature to begin with. How can we ever be alienated from it? We lack the history of that process and hence the assumption of the binary opposition between the nature and the artificial. As technology was transplanted in nation's soil, it's a culture unrooted, assembled with fragment paced together like a plastic flower. So for us, is technology more about intensification of itself rather than a negation of nature or a humanization? So these are the questions I ask myself. I don't think there is one answer to them. It's sort of kind of all of the above, and it depends on where you stand, where you are, what your position is. They all have a different degree of uh, yes or no, good or bad answer to them. In other words, I think one can make a judgment only if you can clearly define where you stand as uh, as that judgment could hold true for your, the others. I really should speak up because uh, <laughs> taking a long time. Um, the next slide I want to share with you that kind of follow from uh, the idea of multiplicity and the paradox of it is uh, this sculpture that I made, you, as you can see in the foreground. It's called Polyphantasma. I like to make up the title of my work sometime. It's, it's combining two words. One is polymer, which stands for syn um, synthetic plastic. And the other word is phantasm, which is sort of a delusion term for simulation, something that intend to uh, 
copy from nature, but in its very development, it ends up creating a world of its own that it does not have any natural counterpart anymore. So I thought that uh, plastic were fitting uh, in that description. And um, here's a detail of the sculpture. What you see here, um, polyphantasma is made of poly, extruded polystyrene, which is a kind of insulation foam that used in building construction in between the wall. And what I did here is I used a handheld router, which is a pretty sophisticated woodworking tool to carve into the foam. And um, as you can see there, within the piece itself, there is various sections and some sections are more premeditated, meaning that I have a template and draw it out, and then I will use the router to, to uh, match up you know, with the template that I had. But then there are other areas that is kind of free form, so I was quite enjoying using the router as a sort of pencil to do free hand, 3D drawing on the phone. And for those of you who are um, who are uh, fluent in woodworking ling lingo. If you use a router and to work on wood, which is not so yielding material, there's something called a feed. So you have to be very careful where you move your router or you will just get yourself hurt because of the grain of the wood. But with styrofoam, such a material that is so, un um, so yielding, you don't need to worry about the feed. And for me, that's a sort of a freedom to mess with the tools, especially a tool that is traditionally associated with a um, with member of the other sex that uh, who is more conversant with it. So I took a lot of uh, liberty with it. And here's a slide to show you this sort of more freehand se section of the piece. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip forward, but here is another series, uh, photographic series that I, I put um, synthetic sculpture I constructed and uh, put in landscape. And oftentimes, because of the concept that was an interesting site, it, the scale of the piece not revealed. So there's a mystery to it. And within the series, three of them is on, I guess, obviously ice. And then one of them is in this sort of mysterious blue surface. I can tell you right now, it's on a really still swimming pool. And um, what I do like to continue to, to say a little bit more is uh, the carved polystyrene work. And this piece, um, now we're up to about uh, 1999. And um, this piece called uh, Bionic Pack. And uh, on one side, it, the overall, it's about four feet wide. Yes, about four, each of the elements is about four feet wide by three feet wide, so it's quite large. And um, as you can, uh, the overall form is actually based on the, the sort of foamy packaging material for a hot drive. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. They kind of look like Japanese sandal to me. But, um, and on one side, uh, all the carving is more uh, rectilinear, which is the more horizontal piece. And the vertical piece that uh, is not quite leaning, it's actually freestanding. That, in, that slide just looks like it's leaning on the wall. The other uh, element is more curvilinear. And I made that piece, it was around the time when um, Apple product become more and more uh, popular. And they really revolutionized the uh, computer because before that, we had a lot of beige IBM computer and the styrofoam block. You know, I had my day of dumpster, <laughs> dumpster diving, <laughs> looking for discarded styrofoam. So I saw the evolution of this more boxy shaped styrofoam block, all of a sudden transition into the more rounded molded form. So there's this sort of organic form. And that always intrigued me why um, that is the case. And, um, and it's really interesting that how our idea of the high tech function not doesn't stop on the utility level but also on a kind of aesthetic level because like why do we need a high tech looking trash can 
Why do we need a high-tech looking toothbrush? Yet we do have those things. I think the reason why we had that is to kind of speak to our public um, imagination towards that um, unknown space that we aspire to, even though it does not really function as something really high-tech, so to speak, it, but it functions on a more philosophical level. And after that, I really want to do another piece that push further the idea of multiplicity and paradox. And while, while the other sculpture um, that engaged in the same process is um, sitting in the middle of the room, I really want to make a piece that so it would uh, delineate the space. And uh, so the, the actual experience of the piece is not static. It will be um, involve the movement of the viewer. And uh, so I guess there is a little, there's more, uh, multiple sort of these. And there's an installation shot of, uh, of uh, to show you the scale. And there's a quick time movies. And uh, you can see what I was, ta I was trying to tell you that the experience of the piece is that um, you have to move around the room to really experience the work. So this piece cannot be consumed by one single gaze. It must be experienced by within time. And what you see will eventually, in a way, I can imagine that you will see the piece and collect this information in your head, which you, with full time, you will have to make a composite in your head to really make up the whole picture together. You see what I'm saying? So that's sort of my attempt to address multiplicity. And within the piece, as you move along, um, you can see there are different sections. Some of them are thicker, some of them is not as thinner. Some of them, the carving on top is very representational. Some of them are very abstract. Some of them look like a, a uh, ancient ruins, and but then they all of a sudden could look like a future city, like Star Trek, or some of them have this sort of more organic, free-flowing form, and then some of them have this more control, uh, greed life form. So I want to kind of put all this set together under one roof, so to speak, and um, and that was the uh, the attempt of the piece. And at the same time, once again, the process, even the process itself is a convergence or a negotiation of different things. Because when you think of it, I, um, I was carving with a router. And a router, even though I, I had called it like a, a, a three-dimensional pencil, but unlike a pencil, a router comes with a certain kind of router bits. And the router bits only comes in half an inch, three quarter inch, they have certain shape, you know, they, they use it to carve crown moldings or the building. So in a way, it is a given form. So what happened in this process, in the carving process, is the negotiation between a pre-given machine form, my free hand, and the sort of premeditated pattern I have. So, so um, in each movement, this free thing is going on at the same time. So there's not one thing that dictates this, like as if I'm, you know, if I was in drawing on paper. So I'm going to stop and move ahead. And you can see how it um, varies. So this one, for example, is more three-dimensional, almost like it's a landscape. And then this is more abstract. And that is very rectilinear and uh, control. And actually, this is inspired after a trip to Legoland. So this whole piece is all done by hand, you know, with a handheld router. So it took almost two years to produce. It's a long process. The whole piece uh, was measured almost 200 feet long. And it came in 48 sections. And 
I didn't have a master plan in the very beginning of the process, but I do have a mental checklist of all the sort of multiplicity that I want to check off. So at one point, it almost become a sort of diary for me that, um, you know, if I see a diagram one day, I will incorporate, uh, go to Legoland, I incorporate. So, for example, in this um, panel, uh, talking about multiplicity, depending on your movement, whether you're moving within the room from left to right or right to left, within the same panel, you can have chaos, going to order, or vice versa, if you uh, go back. So within the same panel, it, there's chaos to order at the same time. Oh, this is, this is what I call the key of the legend to the piece. You know, like on the map, there is the little key or legend to explain the symbol within the map. So this was the collection of all my router bits at one point. So you see, um, I reveal the process of its own making. So there's no mystery within the work itself. So this is, this is how it's made. So you have all these router bits, all these different shapes. So all the thing that you see there is, is a combination of permutation of the possibility of these router bits. Here's a shot of the installation. Actually, it was installed in a gallery in, in LA and that has um, two separate space, the big room and then the smaller room. And I actually block off the entrance to the smaller room. Actually, there's another door that you can go around to, this, to the second room. So that, um, I just want to show you that in, in some time uh, in my large scale installation, I also work with the architecture of the space. And in this slide, you can see there's another, a third photographic series title, um, Diaspora, question mark, touristry. And, um, and it's a photographic series that I play sculpture in the landscape. And I can probably announce to you this shot actually was uh, taken in Colorado. On the way back, uh, I, I had a teaching job at Northwestern University in Chicago. So on the way home back to LA after a year, I... Um, I did a road trip, and then this photographic series was produced uh, in that road trip. So there's a series of about eight images. As you can see, there are these uh, sculpture climbing uh, the landscape and posing for me in place of myself. And they, uh, they quite enjoy Colorado and Utah. Okay, so um, the next installation I want to share with you is Cost Shelf Life. And after Polymathic Styrene, the piece you saw that went, uh, goes around the room, I wanted to do, I want to push it even further. And um, because um, I wanted to play with scale um, in a different way. So I had this idea of what if, so I work with sculpture that sit in the middle of the room, so you have a subject-object relationship, right? And then I have sculpture that go around the room, so you have a different kind of subject-object relationship. But it's still subject and object relationship, including incorporating time. So the next thing that I wanted to do is to really mess up the subject and object relationship. So I had this idea, what if I make a sculpture that I would put the subject in it? So the only way for you to experience the sculpture is to be in it or on it. So, and I had the opportunity to be, to be commissioned by Cap Street Project in San Francisco, who um, allowed me to have um, the means to construct this rather uh, large scale sculptural installation that is made of styrofoam. And I'm going to show you uh, a, a, a shot of that. And then maybe we'll go back to, into the details. Uh, this is a little out of sequence because I really should show you the installation shot of this. Because uh, what I want to show you is, um, first of all, the, in the space in San Francisco, they have the spray foam in the ceiling. And I saw that. I was like, perfect. I'm going to make 
a sculpture that I'm going to sandwich the audience, so as if the audience being packaged to be shipped. And secondly, I'm going to make it so big so that you will have to be in it and on it in order to experience it. So because of that, so I had um, resolved to making form that will actually fit your body. And this shape, you know, going back, that kind of, you know, I was, people commented that they look like jacuzzi. And, uh, and indeed, they, they, they are the scale of jacuzzi. But I can tell you now, these are the... Um, um, uh, form from a uh, toy packaging. You know, like when you buy a toy, they come in this sort of uh, clear plastic clamshell packaging. And uh, so I took those form and I blow it up 20 times and painted it flash, basically. So this is a vacuum form, a giant vacuum form. Um, I was able to actually do it at, over at Warner's Brothers Studio, um, had the technology to do it. And um, and then this slide show you um, one of them is lined with memory foam. So if you guys know what memory foam is, you know if you press it down, it hold your shape for a long minute before it revert back to level ground. And I want I like the idea that in this piece, I'm not using the router to carve the styrofoam or the foam itself, but I'm using the viewer the viewer's body to carve them. So, so that was the idea. And I brought this up because in, the, in this show here, to this room, one of the sculpture titled Vital Organ is actually made of the same material, the memory foam. So this was the first time I played with this stuff. And let's move on. Um, I'm going to have to skip this work. So... Well, I can tell you the title. This title actually is very fun. It's called Do Seen the Block Dream of Being Styrofoam? If you, if, for those of you laughing, you must know that this is a pun on uh, Philip K. Dick's book, uh, Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep? And uh, I got this styrofoam block in Japan, and uh, I don't, don't ask me why they look like Seen the Block. And... So there is um, this body of work that I continue to work with styrofoam. And, and then I really like to get to um, waiting at the place where uh, America parts from Eurasia because in this show, um, three photographs comes from this show and also a, uh, one video, a projection has come from there too. And um, in this, well, this installation right now doesn't look like much, but it's, it's called Intermission, and it's installed in the um, kind of office room in the gallery, and it has, it almost looks like bathroom stalls. And um, here is the, the gallerist working. So I basically shoved this sculpture into the workspace. And uh, in each booth, there is a sculpture, and they are named after uh, a locality. For instance, this piece here is called Chinatown, and that one with the green is called Tahiti. And, uh, and the reason why I made this booth is two, uh, twofold. I, um, this was done in 2005, right around the time when uh, Bush was re-elected, and um, I was thinking about the polling booth and how what a weird structure it is, both private and public at the same time. And then I wanted to conflate that polling booth with uh, the trade show booth, like the art fair booth. So I'm literally making art in a booth for the gallerist. And um, so I have to skip that to move on to... Um, Oh, this piece, that's right. So this is where the piece in um, this show here comes from. It's called Rome. So Rome is named after actually where the, the video was shot from. And it was sitting in one of these booths here. And uh, for those of you who have a chance to look at that piece, 
I can tell you now, I did not throw those plastic bottles into the water. And it's, um, it was taken from over a, a uh, artificial waterway in Rome. And these are actually trash that has been caught in the, the cascade of steps of um, the water and just kind of being tossed like a washer. And uh, I really just happened on it. I was not planning on making a, a video piece, but I had a video with me, so I decided I would take it. Um, I don't need to play it, so let's skip. So, and that was the piece. And within the same show, uh, in, the, in the main room is Power Towers. And this is sculpture. The tall ones stand about six feet tall, and they are made of, um, polyethylene, high density polyethylene. And I was really interested in the idea of power towers, um, especially because of um, our nation dependence on, the, on fossil fuels. So, and what I want to get to, I'm, I, I don't really have time to talk a lot about this installation, I'll just show you details. And the, uh, they're put together with schools, and then I cover the school holes with silly putty, actually. So what you see oozing out from this school hole is silly putty. And there's some details in it. Um, and, uh, oh, oh, I should talk about this piece. This piece is made of correction tape, you know, like the, like the correction uh, liquid you I don't know if you guys still use that before computer time. And, um, but now they make this tape, instead of liquid, they make tape. And once again, I like the idea this tape come in a certain standardized factory sizes. You know, there's certain thickness, big size, medium size, small size. And I like the, to use it to make drawings. So this is one of the correction tape series. And in this show, in the intro wall, you will see a correction tape drawing. So it kind of came from there. And um, this is Red Cat. Um, that's the, the Cal Arts Gallery in downtown. But I'm going to have to skip this. So after, um, after that show, I was really obsessed with uh, power towers. And then there was, I saw some pictures of uh, people um, bathing in front of a power plant. And I thought that was really weird. Like, why people want to do that? Isn't power plant are totally polluted? And, but did some research. That image was, came from uh, Iceland. And actually, it was not polluted because Iceland used geothermal technology to power uh, the elect electricity. And then I did further research on Iceland. And it turns out that there's a lot of seismic activity that produce geothermal because it's sitting on top of the mid-Atlantic range, which, which is in between the um, American plate, the, especially the North American plate and the Eurasia plate. And what happened geologically is that the North American plate is moving away from the Eurasia plate, that creating a lot of seismic activity within Iceland. And I thought at that time, um, what an app metaphor for, uh, for our political situation when Bush decided to win alone to Iraq, sort of um, uh, leaving our traditional European ally, except for UK. And, um, and all we could do is to, to sit and wait. So the next thing I know, I went to Iceland, and I, I brought a little foam sculpture, which is in the form of a of a bench, and I, I made this series and also shoot a little movie. And at that time, I was also personally going through um, a divorce, and my ex-husband uh, is an American, and because I was born in Hong Kong, I don't necessarily see myself as, a, as Chinese alone, but more like a British Chinese. So I'm really as an Eurasian in that sense, maybe not racially, but culturally. So there's another personal metaphor for me to talk about, the splitting between America and Eurasia. And uh, so, so that was a very personal piece to me at the same time. 
And what you didn't see in this show is a few more images in the series that I can now share with you. So here's another image that uh, is not in the show, and here's another one. And, um, and then we are very close, so bear with me. <laughs> here's another sculpture that belonged to the same series um, that talked about the split. And there's a collection of more correction tape drawings. And usually I use the correction tape drawing to work with text, or I kind of play with the different dimension of the, um, the width of the, uh, the tape itself. And this one too long, but I want you to read this one. Can you read it? Good. So this is sort of, you know, the Kinko is like stationary correction tape, you know, correcting something that went wrong, you know, so there's all, oh, I really like this one. Can you tell what it is? It's a shirt. It's, called, it's made by the brand Saturday in California. Do you guys know that brand? Park shirt? Anyway. So I don't think I have a lot of time to uh, go through this either, but I would say a few words. Um, this, is, um, this has direct relationship to vital organs. Um, in 2007, I did a show called Sink Like a Submarine, and this is the, the title piece of that show. And in that show, um, well, this piece actually is made of... Um, if you see, uh, the middle part is, is a reject um, part from a submarine. And uh, it's a factory because something's wrong with it. And I got it in a fa factory surplus store. And, um, and it's in this sort of greenish resin. And uh, to my eye, they look like jade. So the next thing I know is I wanted to make a sculpture that kind of talk about ancient weapons at the same time. So I kind of made cast this form in those ancient, like, sword form in um, green resin shape. And, and then I thought that um, it need to be a figure. So as a figure, I place a um, jade, uh, as a carved jade, uh, human heart-shaped organ in the middle. I didn't carve it. I actually had to have it carved by a master J. Carver, and um, so, and that was the origin of the more recent development on the concept of organ. And within the show, I try to entertain the use of military material in three different ways. One way is to use it lit uh, quite literally to be the actual material that used in the military, like a submarine. And the other way is to use it more. Uh, this is another piece that is kind of like that. Um, and this, if you look down the tube, there's another J heart in the very bottom of it. It's called C at the bottom of the C. And um, another way to use the military material is more metaphoric. And uh, I was thinking about the most advanced military technology which is not sword, which is not submarine or tank, but computer technology, digital com uh, information technology and intelligence. And I discovered that the first computer was actually inspired by a programmable loom called a jackcart loom. Because loom is like a weave pattern, zero and one, this sort of punch cart technology. So in this show, I made a series of uh, sculpture that based on the loom shape. So it's titled Jack of Art, just kind of punning on Jack Hart loom. And um, so here's another loom. There's a lot of looms. There's more looms. <laughs> um, so you get a sense of it. And the third way in which I use military um, form in this show is uh, representational. In this piece, you can see, I don't have a detail. I don't know if you can tell on the left-hand side. Actually, it's, it's, it's sort of sideways. I carved a little drawing of a tank in it. And the overall shape of this sculpture 
have this sort of tank track, you know, motif going on. And what happened in here is, is a roll of vinyl that I didn't, I cut one slice, but I maintained the whole vinyl because I want to preserve the form, how it came from the factory. All I did was I cut one slice, like I said, um, actually multiple slides of it, and then I wrap around the styrofoam to create a sort of tent track, and then keep the whole material for it to show you where it come from. And then in the same show, there's a more literal piece use of a tank track, and inside, whoops, is this out of sequence? Oh, I, this is really weird. What happened? <laughs> I don't know why it's going backward. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened. Uh, I want to show you the details. This inside the, um, the the tract is actually made of styrofoam block that I carved. But inside the round shape is little mini globes, and um, and a few of them actually made a combo map to to uh, mimic the mini globes. And that's kind of where um, that piece in that room come from. That uh, platform. Uh, part of Quantum Shirley. I'm going to skip this piece. So, moving forward, um, so the, the latest attempt to work with the idea of multiplicity and negotiation of convergence is called the Quantum Shirley series. And um, I had always toyed with the idea of using my own life story in my work, but I was hesitant to do that for a number of reasons. And, but it got to a point that I, I, I really wanted to use this story, which very quickly was that um, my mom was having difficulty when I was born. I was the fourth child, and she almost gave me up uh, to her cousin for adoption. And her cousin lived in Tahiti, and she was living, my mom's living in Hong Kong. And that didn't happen because some events, so it didn't happen, but I grew up <laughs> hearing my mom saying, I wish I sent you to Tahiti, you're so naughty. And then I would say, I wish you did, you know. So, um, and eventually I get to meet uh, my mom's cousin, Simone, and even go, uh, went to Tahiti to visit her. And, and then in this story, I, I realized there is a number of things going on that the reason why my mom was in Hong Kong and Simone was in Tahiti has to do with um, trading. Be well, actually, my mom was born in Malaysia, and because she was third generation Chinese, migrating from mainland China, and they were looking for a job because of the civil war going on, so they end up in Malaysia to work in a rubber plantation. But uh, that got saturated, so part of her family, which is Simone's family, left Malaysia to went to Tahiti to work in the vanilla bean plant plantation. So that's how she ended up growing up in uh, Tahiti. And, um, and so, so I was thinking, um, how interesting, like, what if I did grow up in Tahiti? Because eventually when I visited her, she actually, um, Simone had four other ch uh, children. It's not like she was childless. And they all become very artistically inclined. They're all educated in Paris. And I thought, you know, had I grown up in Tahiti, I probably would end up being an artist too. So maybe there's a quantum world going there. There is actually a quantum Shirley that actually did happen. The adoption did happen. It's just that I am limited to my reality, my perception that I'm not able to perceive that quantum uh, space. And on the other hand, you can s say that this sort of personal story is also a larger story of um, colonization. It's a larger story of material uh, route. And so what is really um, exciting for me in this series is the concept of what seeming to be a personal narrative can be explained in a multiple uh, way. It can be explained as a political uh, event, as a political history, or a material um, 
circulation or a scientific way as in quantum physics. So I'm really drawn to this many different possible way of interpreting this story. So that piece, which is here, but you don't, you didn't get to see it, unfortunately, because we um, had to make some uh, executive decision to um, to edit that out. But uh, on one, you, this is called superposition. I'm talking about the piece um, in the front, not in the back. Um, the clouds stand for Hong Kong. It's always rainy and cloudy, and on the left is the wave that stands for Tahiti, and um, it's a playing card. On both sides is number eight. So there is a story that scientists like to use to illustrate quantum physics, which is that when a playing, uh, playing card falls, it actually falls on both sides. It's called the um, collapse of the wave function. The reason why we only see it falling on one side because we're only limited to one reality. We're not able to see the other reality. So this is the piece you do see in this room um, that kind of talked about the story. So I hope now it makes more sense to you. And I think that, uh, did I cover it all? <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. I'd like to take maybe a couple of questions before we totally ran out of steam and getting totally hungry. <laughs> yes, please. They always come hand in hand from the get go. Like I said, I thought I was more drawn to material, but then as I I don't know, you know, memory kind of play tricks on you too. So I guess if you ask me now as an artist been working this way for over 15 years, it definitely goes hands in hands. You know, I don't, you know, there's, I always reading things, you know, cause I sort of like to look at um, stuff in the world and come up with story with them and try to figure out why this happened. You know, I see this here in this country, but the same thing in a different country mean different thing, which is really, diff really interesting for me. So, um, so when I uh, discover material, I think it kind of is already both at the same time, that I'm drawn to the material for a sort of phenomenological property, but at the same time, the semiotic uh, reference must be very intriguing to me for me to, to get interested in. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Yes. I think you articulate it quite well. I don't know what else I can add to it. Excellent. Well, because I think ultimately, um, I was having this conversation with Courtney the other day. We talk about subjectivity versus objectivity. And uh, I was really influenced by Donna Holloway's writing. And I thought one thing she wrote about that really completely changed my life, I could claim that, is her idea of uh, objectivity is that um, you can only be partial. As a human being, we only always can only have partial perspective. And, um, and I think that is really interesting for me to hear that, and she said that the moment you can admit to that partial perspective, then you can have true objectivity. 
So I think that is where the negotiation comes from. That it is true that sometimes you sort of think that you are the master of something or you are the subject of something, I should say. But other time you are just being the agent of something to let things happen upon you. So in a way, you know, like in art classes, you know, I, I hear the word intention get thrown around quite a bit. You know, what is your intention in making this? Which is true, you know, as, as a student or as an artist, you kind of think about these things in those terms. But sometimes I find that word pretty inadequate because in, intention have too much of an emphasis on the subject placing control on to the material or the process or the concept even. I like the word attention. This is actually where my other, I didn't talk about it at all, is it's sort of the Buddhist perspective that comes in. And um, it's not so much of intention, but it's the things are already there. It's just waiting for us to uncover it. So if you have the attention, you attend to it, then you see it is there. So, and the other thing I can add upon on that on a, on a different way is that working with plastic, as you can tell, and also I, uh, this is not the first time I give lecture. I had to uh, work with different kind of audience, and uh, this sort of uh, environmental issue oftentimes comes up. It's like, do you feel guilty that you're using this awful material that further destroy the world? And uh, of course I do, you know. And as everyone, you know, who work, uh, who is an artist do, if you're a printmaker, you worry about where your chemical goes to. You're a photographer, if you're doing the old-fashioned way, where the chemical going down the drain goes to. You know, you're working with uh, painting, you know, all the sort of hard metal. Of course we all do, right? And um, for me, plastic is neither good or evil. It's really is subjected to human uses and interpretation. In a way, if you boil down to a plastic, it's really just a formula. All the base material is petroleum derived, and all the base material naturally occur in nature. So what is plastic about it? What is constructed about it is the formula. We, the human, have the formula to combine this molecule together to create complex bond. The formula itself, the combination itself, the syntax itself is, artif is artificial, not the substance. The substance from nature, it doesn't come from nowhere. So it really is upon us to negotiate how we use it, how we interpret it. And, um, you know, it's the, it's the formula, it's the language, it's the syntax. All of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. So turn it off. Okay, shut down. Yes.